Hello, I'm Dr. Carmeletta Williams. I'm the Executive Director of the Black Archives in Mid America in Kansas City. Uh, we're at 1722 East 17th Terrace in the historic 18th and Vine Jazz District in Kansas City, Missouri. When you get a chance, please come to Kansas City and visit. I'd love to take you on a tour. But right now, I'm here to talk to you about uh, the artist extraordinaire Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes has, um, has a continual value not just to black Americans, but to the entire world. And as we go through these political seasons, we can see where uh, his importance has this permanence. We see politicians quoting him from not just this election, but for the past four elections, every candidate running for president has chosen some aspect of Hughes's work to use as a campaign slogan. So he is forever um, important to us and especially to us as Americans and to uh, those of us who are looking to connect a culture. Art is the only way to do it. When we're in this uh, age of quarantine and coronavirus and COVID-19 and, and we're being separated from each other, the one thread that holds us together is art. And so um, I'm very honored that you asked me to bring this convocation and even more so to talk to you about Langston Hughes. But this guy who was so world famous didn't have an easy life. Um, he started out on a trouble road. So I'm going to share my screen with you and hopefully this will work right because I have a PowerPoint. Okay, Langston Hughes born on a troubled road. Um, this is the handsome, effervescent Langston Hughes. And he's in his 60s at this point for this picture. And um, he was born in Joplin, traveled the world, and came to identify Harlem as his home. And this is the sweet baby Langston. His mother, Carrie, um, was the belle of Black Lawrence. Uh, and she was the belle of Black Lawrence because she couldn't be the belle of Lawrence. Uh, segregation was such an intrinsic part of life uh, at that time in Kansas and Missouri and throughout the world um, that separate societies and cultures actually developed. So Carrie then had the honor. Her father um, and her brothers were uh, newspaper people. Her mother refused to work. Um, because she refused to be a domestic to white, to white women. Um, but her father made sure that Carrie expressed the arts and um, shared and participated in the cultural life. And this sweet little baby spent his whole life trying to get his mother's unconditional love. This is his father, James Nathaniel Hughes. Um, Carrie and James met at Langston University, which was named after Langston Hughes's uncle. Um, and he studied for the bar, uh, passed the exams, but could not get a license to practice in Missouri. Um, and he got fed up with all of the racism that he was facing as a black man in this country. So he vacated. Um, Arnold Rampersad, the preeminent Hughes biographer, and I both think that James was not in Joplin when Langston was born. Langston was the second child born to James and Carrie. The first one uh, didn't get a name, so he must have been stillborn. But he's buried as um, baby boy Hughes in, a, in the Potter's Field in um, Joplin, Missouri. This is Carrie. Oh my goodness, I'm hiding her face. Let's see if I, if I can move, okay. And this is his grandmother, Mary Leary Patterson Sampson Langston. Uh, Mary was a proud abolitionist. She was the first black woman to go to Oberlin College. She got that privilege because her brothers were adopted by the president of the college, a white man, and he made sure that they attended and that Mary attended. Um, her first husband, uh, Leary, um, her first husband was an abolitionist. He was with John Brown at Harper's Ferry. He didn't get killed at Harper's Ferry, but he was wounded there and a farmer found him in a trench and took him to his barn and took care of him until he died. 
And then he sent his blood-stained, bullet-riddled shawl to Mary. Um, her second husband was a friend of her first husband, and he was also an abolitionist. So she came from this proud background that said black folks were not going to be subservient to whites. This is young Langston. Uh, he's a child, he's about 13 in this picture. And uh, this is his last year in Lawrence, Kansas. His mother, Carrie James was in Mexico. He went to Cuba and then he went to Mexico to try to find a world where he could operate and his blackness would not hold him back. And Carrie got fed up with trying to be a single parent and, and take care of this child and she was working a series of low paying jobs. She did have a teaching degree and at one point taught, but in Missouri, she was only able to do domestic work. So she took her baby uh, when he was about three years old to her mother, Mary, in um, Lawrence, and she raised him. She took care of him, and Carrie would periodically come in and take Langston and take care of him for a few months, but eventually he ended back with his grandmother, and his grandmother died when he was 13. Langston thought at this time that he was going to then go with his mother. She had remarried, uh, and Homer, her, her husband, had a son, Gwen, and he thought he was going to be a part of that big happy family. So Carrie comes to take care of her mother in her last days, and uh, when she dies, she did what Zora Neale Hurston calls in Their Eyes Were Watching God, she dressed like grief. She had a long black veil, a long black dress, um, and she grieved uh, publicly for her mother. And then she took her husband and her stepchild and left, and she left Langston there with, uh, as he says, aunts and uncles who were not relatives. And this is Carrie and her husband, Homer. And we don't know who this friend is. And this is Langston. And he's very happy uh, to be with Carrie. After his grandmother dies, he, he lives with the aunt and uncle for a year. And then he uh, goes to Cleveland to live with Carrie. And he's extremely happy to be with his mom. But that doesn't last long. Uh, he spends his high school years living alone in this attic apartment up here by himself. And as he said, he had rice and hot dogs for every meal. That's all he could afford, and that's all he knew how to cook. And Carrie had gone on. He said she's always looking for a better place to live, someplace where she could hang the laundry out in the yard or for a better job or chasing her, her man. But in the interim, Langston then is living by himself. When he graduated from high school, he was living alone. When he graduates from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, which was a securitous uh, educational journey, he, his father, he goes to visit his father in Mexico uh, twice, once between his junior and senior year, and he realized that his father hated black people. And he would tell Langston that he wanted him to go away to school so that he could get a classical education. And the quote is, I don't want you living like a nigga among niggas. Langston needed black people and he wanted them. Um, so he made a compromise with his father that he would not go to Europe to college, but he would go to Columbia University in New York. Columbia got him close to Harlem. Um, after his first year, and he would study engineering because that would give him a profession that um, could support him. And that's what his father wanted. And after a year, Langston understood that it was not for him. It's not that his grades were bad. He just didn't have any interest in it. He wanted to be a writer. Uh, and so he told his father he needn't support him any longer, that, um, that he was not going to continue at Columbia to be an engineer, which really made his mother mad because his father had paid child support for Langston all this time. And Langston never got that money. That was Carrie's money. So she was furious then when Langston told his father not to send any more money because that cut off that money that she was getting. Um, he gets on a ship. He works as a scullery boy, gets to Europe, comes back, and then he meets some people through his art. Uh, and he gets a mentor who gets him into uh, Lincoln University. Um, what we call now an HBCU, a black college in Pennsylvania. When he graduates, Carrie's there looking like the proud mother. 
Langston became famous, his iconic poem is A Negro Speaks of Rivers. And as he's going across the Mississippi on a train to go visit his father in Mexico, he, uh, he rides across the Mississippi River and then he sees this vision of black life from Africa to his present time. And he writes that poem and that becomes his signature poem. Um, the one that he becomes most well known for uh, and for the longest. But he really gets known as a mover and shaker in the Harlem Renaissance. This is a forced ph phenomenon, a revolution, a spiritual coming of age. During the Harlem Renaissance, things changed in African-American arts and letters. No longer were black people emulating the work of white European men. And that's what we had seen in all of the eras, all of the eras previous to this. But, um, and, and Hughes tells us that. He says, you know what? Us black writers are going to do our art our way. And if white folk don't like it, we don't care. And if black folks don't like it, we don't care. And then he has this, the Tom Tom, uh, image in there which resonates back to Africa just as in the Negro Speaks of Rivers that connects then that African heritage to his noun which is we're going to speak our own truths we're going to tell about our own realities and it changes forever it never goes back after the Harlem Renaissance comes the Chicago Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement but it never goes back to that replica uh, of white literature anymore And in the Harlem Renaissance, he meets with another uh, famous Kansas artist, Aaron Douglas, who's a painter from Topeka, Kansas. And uh, Douglas is known for his, um, his uh, covers of, um, of magazines. And all of his, his art is black and angular uh, and almost angry in the way that it's presented. He, he doesn't have any smooth, rounded edges or any color jumping out at you. It's, it's reality, it's black, it's gray, it's white. And he, he tells Langston um, what, what he sees their mission as, as artists functioning at this time to transform black art. And he says, your problem, Langston, my problem, no, our problem is to conceive, develop, and establish an art era. Not white art painted black. No, let's bear our arms and plunge deep through laughter, through pain, through sorrow, through hope, through disappointment, and to the very depths of the souls of our people. And drag forth materials, crude, rough, neglected. Then let's sing it, write it, Paint it. Let's do the impossible. Let's create something transcendentally material, mystically objective, earthy, spiritually earthy, dynamic. And that's what they did. That's what they did. And in Hughes's um, essay, The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain, he writes about that journey up that mountain to create this new art form. And he says that mountain was climbed and circumvented by artists who wanted to be seen, seen clearly as who they are. He didn't say that, I said that. Hughes confesses that his work is truly racial and is derived from the life he has led. He told a reporter from the New York Times that when he dies, if the headline says Negro poet dies, he's perfectly fine with that. And he said, because if ever there was a Negro artist, it is me. And he was proud of that blackness and how the reality of his being black manifested itself in his art. And through his art then, he found a new freedom to express himself as he wished. And that was important to him because this is a little boy who struggled to find himself, to self-identify because he didn't have those parental boundaries, those uh, patterns, those mentors to tell him what it took to be a man, what it meant to be black, uh, and how he would have to survive, what he would have to do. And instead, he found his own way, and he did it largely through his heart. 
you also found functional families. Um, if you don't, if your physical, biological family is not operating as such, then it's okay to find a functional family. If your grandmother raises you, then she is functioning as your mother. If um, your best friend is by your side and committed to helping you and to supporting you, then that can be your brother or your sister. And he found functional family. And uh, Toy and Emerson Harper uh, were friends of his, Toy was a friend of his mother's and she was from Garnett, Kansas. And they met again in New York, in Harlem. And Toy then became his, his aunt, his functional aunt again, even though they weren't related. They bought a brownstone together in Harlem. They lived together, they made art together, they made music together. Uh, and they were family. They threw parties together and dinners together and people would gather at their apartment um, to just celebrate life and be happy. And Langston was comfortable then having that family, even though it wasn't his biological family. And he and Toy uh, bought the brownstone together. And in his first will, Hughes had several wills. In his first will, he said that if he died first, then Toy would have his part of it. Nobody else had any um, interest in, in that apartment. But Toy died first. And when Toy died, he changed his will to say that Emerson, Toy's husband, uh, could live in that house until he died at no rent and did not owe anybody anything. Those were his, his family members and he took care of them. And remember he had a, um, a stepbrother and who had several children. So he also had nieces and nephews. And he had functional family and his best friend, Erna Bontoms, who was his lookalike. Uh, but they also shared art. The difference was Bontoms um, got married and had many children, but they all called him Uncle Langston. Uh, and this is Hughes again. And his I Too Sing America, Langston Hughes unfurled. I'm working with a group called the um, um, Dream Documentary Collective. And we want to do a documentary on his life that shows honestly uh, what Hughes' life was like. I'm going to show you just a part of, of this trailer for the, for the documentary. Langston Hughes is timeless and it's timely. He speaks to the current moment. We're still talking about Langston Hughes almost 50 years after his passing. To me, Langston Hughes is one of the central poets and writers of the American experience. He is bound to be able to speak through his art to any one of the major questions affecting American culture today. When the clamor over Black Lives Matter emerged, a number of Hughes's words came forward, and in particular, a poem that went viral. This is for the kids who die, black and white. For kids will die certainly, the old and the rich will live on a while, as always, eating blood and gold, letting kids die. He was admired for his courage to say things that others were unable or unwilling to say at the time. Kids would die in the swamps of Mississippi organizing sharecroppers. Kids would die in the streets of Chicago organizing workers. He cuts to the quick of abandonment and sense of worthiness uh, as well as any writer I know. Whites and Filipinos, Negroes and Mexicans, all kinds of kids will die who don't believe in lies and bribes and continue and a lousy peace. He was an only child who had been abandoned many times, uh, but he survived and he thrived. And the sleazy courts and the bribe preaching police and the blood loving generals and the money loving preachers will all raise their hands against the kids who died. When we stop and think about politicians who have begun to use some of his very words in their campaign rhetoric. For the kids who die are like iron in the blood of the people. And the old and the rich don't want the people to get wise to their own power. Langston Hughes is a poet lawyer of the world. He translated the language of the language. He represents ordinary people all over the world. 
their struggles, their sorrows, their joys. Listen, kids who die, maybe now there will be no monument for you except in our hearts. But the day will come when the marching feet of the masses will raise for you a living monument of love and joy and laughter. Black hands and white hands clasped as one. And a song that reaches the sky, the song of the life triumphant through the kids who die. This is certainly timely as we're going through um, current political and cultural uh, issues with uh, people like George Floyd, uh, who died with a policeman's knee, foot on his neck, and, and Breonna Taylor, who was murdered. We're still seeing kids who die. We saw a, a little kid in a park with a play gun who was murdered. Um, and Hughes is still timely. Everything that he said in 1960 is still important now in 2020. So this is James Mercer Langston Hughes, um, America's poet, the world's poet. Even Winston Churchill um, would quote Langston Hughes. Thank you. Please write me, stay in touch, uh, let me know. But I want you to, to know that, um, that Hughes is evergreen. There's a term in publishing, and those of you who are writers will know this, evergreen. Uh, it means like a tree. It's, it doesn't die. It continues to grow and to thrive. And when we look at art and we look at the people who create art, uh, that's what makes them lasting is who are they appealing to? What is their purpose and who is their audience? And it's all of us. And when we have a poet who's writing in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and we're still repeating his works in uh, 2000, 20, uh, then we have that evergreen poet. We have a poet whose legacy is to the people and especially to the American people. We have somebody who wrote from his heart because he was struggling to find who he was. And those stories tend to be more universal than we want to give them credit for being. We don't know how many children there are uh, struggling to find that connection to family. He spent his whole life trying to connect with his mother, to build a permanent, uh, loving relationship. And she just continued to engage in emotional blackmail. Uh, I have a book, not to be self-promoting, uh, my dear boy, and it's the letters from his mother to him over the last 20 years of her life when she went from performing on Broadway to dying of breast cancer. But in those letters, she would write him and say, if you really loved me, you would send me money. Or, no wonder we're not close. Uh, I need a coat. Buy me a coat. Or, um, tell me that you love me by helping me get a ticket so that I can go to Kansas City to the Literary Society meeting. And he did it. He went into debt to bury her. Um, and it took him years to pay that off because that trouble road that he got started on in Joplin to parents that actually didn't love each other uh, there are many stories of, of Carrie being in, in Pennsylvania and James being someplace else and she's traveling with family and then she loses one baby and then he's not there for the birth of the second. They tried to reconcile once and Carrie took her mother and Langston to Mexico. There was an earthquake and scorpions were coming out of the walls and she said, no, I'm not having this. And I think he was five years old at the time. I think that's the first time that he saw his father. It's certainly the first time that he remembered seeing his father. And then he tried to fit in with both of his parents. His father wanted him to have a career, have a profession, but it wasn't the profession he wanted. He wanted him to be an engineer, to be an architect, to be a lawyer. And Langston was a writer. He knew in his soul that he was a poet, that he was a writer but he found a way to make a living. He is um, one of the first 
we think there was one other um, African-American artist who was able to make his living solely by his work. He didn't start out that way. He started out working uh, in kitchens. He was a busboy. In fact, there's a, a play, The Busboy Poet. Uh, he was a playwright. He worked on ships. He was a scullery boy. Um, he did anything to survive. He worked in a laundry when he got back from the ship to try to be with Carrie, try to build that family relationship, uh, and it failed. He, he realized that he couldn't do it. He couldn't live with relatives. He couldn't live with her and with Gwen. He um, sent her money constantly to try to support her and to support um, Kit, Gwen, um, and it wasn't appreciated. And so we know that she also wasted a lot of money. But that was the only way she would give him entree into her life, is if he sent her money. So he struggled. He struggled as a chef. He struggled as a young man. He struggled in college. Other kids uh, at the school were leaving for the Christmas break. And Langston talk, uh, talked the um, uh, headmaster, the chancellor at the university, to let him stay in his dorm while. So it's a very, very troubled road. He, he went to Russia to make a film on black uh, relations and it never got made. He said it was a terrible script. Uh, nobody saw that. The Russians said, okay, we can give you a ticket back home or you can stay. And he decided to stay. So he stayed in Russia for a year. And then from there, he went to China. He wasn't in a rush to come back home and try to reunite with his mother. Um, and that stormy road, that troubled road uh, that he was born on continued his whole life. When Carrie died, even, he, he went and got her uh, and brought her to New York to live with him so that she could get different medical care. Uh, she always complained about the medical care that she was getting, and he was sending every dime that he made to the doctors to take care of her. And the doctor um, told him, said, you know, she has a terrible blood blister, a uh, tumor in her breast, and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, but he wanted to make her comfortable and to make sure she didn't have pain. And then she wanted still to live, of course. So he brought her to New York and cared for her and sent her to doctors there so that he, he had a clear conscience that he did everything that he could to make that relationship work and to make his mother love him. Um, I think that she did as far as she knew how. And uh, as my grandmother used to say, she did the best she could with what she knew. She just didn't know how to love him. Uh, not in a way that made him feel comfortable and loved and fulfilled. Uh, he borrowed money again to, to bury her. And then uh, in doing research for my book, I realized that the difference in their lifespans was 22 days. So I don't know why Langston's life was 22 days longer than Carrie, but maybe that was his reward for all of the sacrifices he had made um, with her and to uh, make her happy and to try to connect with her and to get her to love him. So you have the great American poet, the great world poet who was born on a troubled road. Thanks.